Good evening, everybody, and welcome to The Future We Want, Who Pays for a Pandemic? Before we begin, on behalf of the UNAA, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the Turrbal and Yagara people. And we'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and importantly, those of the future. As an organization, we're continually working to improve as an ally in efforts for reconciliation and acknowledge that we still have much to learn from this nation's first peoples. And what I'd like to do before we begin is to get anybody who's on the chat this evening to put in the chat box your name and where you're from. But importantly, if you know, uh, include the names of the traditional owners of that land. So my name's Joel Lindsay, and I'm joining from Mianjin or Brisbane, the traditional home of the Turbulent and Yagara people. So put that in the chat. We find it's a really interesting way to see where people are joining from, and we all learn. So as I said, my name is Joel Lindsay. I am the president of the uh, United Nations Association of Australia Young Professionals. And under the banner of UNAA, uh, the young professionals advocate and engage young Australians in the work and values of the United Nations. To do this, we use the Sustainable Development Goal Agenda as a guide. And we host events like this in the hope that we can bring people together to discuss the important issues facing young Australians, learn what we can do to help, and then hopefully inspire action. Tonight, we'd like to continue this learning by hosting the fourth in our Future We Want online event series. So far this year, we've highlighted the leadership and voice of young Australians championing Indigenous reconciliation, promoting refugee and asylum seeker rights, and advocating humanitarianism. Tonight, we're looking at the economic future of young Australia and what our choices as a nation, what choices we can make as a nation to ensure that the resulting future after COVID-19 is a future that's safe, fair, and sustainable for all people. So tonight in asking who pays for a pandemic, we hope to better understand what needs to be done to ensure we don't waste the opportunity presented by COVID-19. To do that, we've kindly asked two of Australia's leading economic minds, Danielle Wood, CEO of the Grattan Institute, and John Quiggan, Professor of Economics at the University of Queensland, to join us tonight. We chose John and Danielle because of the leadership they've both shown in advocating for equity and forward thinking during this global economic and health crisis. And we hope some of their quality stays with us after the event finishes tonight. As your moderator for this evening, I will substitute my enthusiasm for the topic in place of any formal training in economics. I'd like to pause here to give a quick shout out to my fellow arts grad students because arts is important too. So we'll start tonight by asking each of our panelists the question, who pays for a pandemic? after which we'll have a conversation covering some of the many interlinked issues facing COVID-19 Australia and close by engaging you, our audience, in a Q&A. Without further ado, I'd like to kick us off by asking Danielle Wood to introduce herself and answer the question, who pays for a pandemic? Fantastic. Thank you very much, Joel, and um, thank you for the invite to come and talk to this fantastic group. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of land, and I'm coming to you this evening um, from Boonarung land. Um, so, quickly to introduce myself, um, I'm CEO of the Grattan Institute. We're an independent public policy think tank. Uh, we focus on domestic policy and really trying to come up with uh, practical solutions to, to pressing policy problems. And um, quite early on in COVID, uh, we quickly came to the conclusion that there would be no more pressing policy problem, perhaps with the exception of climate change, um, that would have such a big difference really to, to all of our lives over the next decade. Um, so this is an area where policy matters a lot. Um, there are choices that we will make on the health front, on the economic front, um, that will have a big bearing on our outcomes and a big bearing on the well-being of everyone, but particularly young people. Um, so if I just give you a quick highlights package on, on the economics front, perhaps in terms of where we're at. Um, we are in the midst of the biggest shock since the Great Depression. Um, we saw the quarterly accounts data come out last week, um, confirming that in annual terms, it's the biggest fall since 1930. Um, that upfront shock was really related to the fallout directly from the virus. Um, different countries dealt with the health problems in different ways. Australia obviously went to lockdown essentially brick walling um, large sections of the economy. Um, but regardless of the way in which countries responded, anyone that had the virus out and about in the community saw big hits to economic activity via falls in consumption investment. 
Um, the human face to all of that, of course, is unemployment. Uh, we've seen 1 million Australians lose their jobs, another 1.1 or more um, lose hours, uh, and young people have fared relatively worse than the rest of the population. Um, this is always the case in economic downturn because young people make up uh, or a bigger share of the group of new job seekers. Uh, we always see youth unemployment move higher than general unemployment in a recession. It's exacerbated this time round because those frontline sectors that have been hit hardest, uh, accommodation and food services, arts and recreation, are really big employers of young people. Um, but I think the thing that um, has been missed or not fully appreciated so far um, is the extent to which um, government supports have been masking a lot of the, the economic fallout to date. Um, so if you've lost your job, you're absolutely feeling it. If you're a business in the frontline sector, you're absolutely feeling it. Um, but if you're someone that you know, has managed to keep your employment, um, you may not kind of feel like you're in an economic shock as large as we are. Uh, we have seen unprecedented response from the government and uh, I, like everyone else, is unsick of that word in this crisis, but you know, it, does, uh, it, it has a role because we are in very, very unusual times. We've seen the federal government pump in directly about $128 billion over a six month period, more than 10% of GDP. Um, you know, once you add in state governments and you add in early super withdrawals, you know, you're getting close to 15% of GDP. Um, so undoubtedly that has softened the blow. Uh, we've actually seen business insolvency fall this year compared to the previous year. Um, that's largely because of those supports, things like JobKeeper, cash flow supports. Uh, there's also been some changes to insolvency laws. We've had some changes to the way in which landlords and tenants negotiate rents. Um, that's allowed a lot of businesses to hang in there. Um, similarly, we've actually seen household incomes overall rise during the pandemic, uh, essentially because the increase in government benefits and supports was bigger than the decline in uh, wage and, and salary income. Um, so some groups have seen an income rise, uh, particularly part-time workers on, on JobKeeper, as well as people that have been on unemployment benefits for a long time, effectively saw a doubling of their payments. Um, so all of that has been good. The emergency measures, uh, you know, we can certainly talk about whether they were perfectly designed and they weren't, but you know, they've effectively done their job. Uh, my big concern is what the next phase looks like. Um, those measures are going to start to phase out come the end of September. We're going to see a big drop off in government supports in the economy, effectively going from a world where government's pumping in about 16 billion a month on average to a world where they're pumping in 6 billion a month. Um, so that's going to leave a substantial hole. Um, we think that consumers and businesses will remain cautious in that world. Uh, we know that debt overhang is going to be a problem. A lot of households, a lot of businesses have deferred loans or deferred rents. Um, on the other side, they're going to have to catch up those payments. That's going to further weaken their capacity for spending and investment. Uh, we, we are you know, certainly going to see uh, more households foreclosing on mortgages as those loan repayment holidays come to an end uh, and business foreclosures, I'm afraid, are probably going to rise quite substantially. Um, there's certainly survey evidence to suggest up to 10% of small businesses, 6% of medium businesses think that they're going to close their doors permanently after those government supports come to an end. Um, so, you know, none of this is <laughs> great news. Um, the RBA forecasts that unemployment will hit 10% by the end of the year uh, still be sitting at 8.5% by the end of 2021. Uh, and frankly, you know, I think that is too high for too long. Um, we know um, there's a huge economic literature on the scarring effects of unemployment. Um, you know, this affects people not just in the period where they're unemployed. If they have a long spell of unemployment, it can be, you know, two years, five years, even a decade later, you can see it in the labour market outcomes of that group. Um, you know, there's also interesting economic sort of macro literature about the long-term impacts of running your economy below potential for too long. Uh, and it looks like it changes your forward growth trajectory. Um, so there is a very strong case for governments to take action to do something about this. Um, so we estimate that if the government were to spend about 100 to 120 billion in stimulus, um, that over the next 18 months, that would be enough to bring unemployment down to something closer to the natural rate. Uh, or, or sort of 5% around there, which is you know, what we need to get wages growing again. Um, so what would that look like? 
um, you know, it should be focused on delivering jobs. It should be focused on delivering long-term benefits to the community. Um, so, there, you know, there's a long wish list. I might just talk about a couple. Um, look, social housing is at the top of many lists for a good reason. Uh, construction sector always takes a blow during downturn. Uh, you can ramp it up quickly, it's fast to roll out, and we have a massive need for more social housing. Um, but really importantly this time, I think we need to be clear that this is not just a tradey recession. Uh, it's actually services sectors that have been hit really hard. Um, so we should be looking at investments in government spending on services, uh, particularly, I think, in areas of social needs that have emerged during COVID, so things like mental health, um, aged care. We've, we've got a proposal which is to do with um, rolling out an intensive tutoring program to help disadvantaged students catch up on lost learning during the pandemic. Uh, I think we need to look at incentives for, for hiring uh, beyond the phase out of JobKeeper. So things like a hiring bonus or sort of incremental payroll bonus in affected sectors make sense. Um, and then a couple of other things which are not sort of traditional stimulus measures, but are long overdue and make good economic sense right now um, is increases in income assistance. So increasing the permanent rate of new start, uh, increasing rent assistance, and boosting the childcare subsidy would all help people be job ready. Um, so to get to the, the overarching question of this evening, uh, who pays? Um, the answer is really all of us should pay. Um, you know, in a shock of this size, we want the government to be using its balance sheet to spread the cost of the shock over time. Um, the other advantage of having the government in there doing the heavy lifting is it spreads the costs throughout the community. So when we have a pandemic, uh, we know that certain groups are hit much harder economically, uh, and it's been um, largely young people and low income people that are really um, in those sort of frontline sectors. Um, so it, it's obvious that government should be intervening in a big way here. Uh, the case is strengthened even further by the fact that money is ridiculously cheap right now. Um, you know, the federal government can borrow for 30 years at less than the RBA's target ban for inflation. Um, effectively, people are paying the government to hold on to its money. Um, so we do not need to be worried about debt sustainability, um, certainly within the bans that we're, we're talking about. Um, we've done some numbers looking at our debt position. Um, it is extremely manageable, even if we come out of this crisis with substantially higher debt and lacklustre growth. Um, we still see debt stabilising as a share of GDP. Um, so what I would say to young people is don't let the debt keep you up at night, um, no matter what you're reading in the media. Uh, if you are going to stay up at night, it should be about the risk of the government not doing enough, not investing enough to create jobs and uh, get the economic activity moving again. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Joel. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, I've got a few notes down and we'll get back to that in the conversation after this. Uh, John, same okay. question to you. Thanks for being here. And in your opinion, who pays for the pandemic? Well, I think unlike previous financial crises, uh, previous economic crises, mm -hmm. all of which in some sense have the characteristic that um, uh, there's inadequate demand for goods and services, that people, uh, there's people ready and willing to supply the goods and services, but um, uh, somehow or other the financial system has broken down or the government has introduced policies which mean they can't. In the lockdown phase of the pandemic and to some extent continuing in the future, we simply have a situation where a whole bunch of jobs can't be done. Uh, if, if we're in the lockdown, you can't, somebody whose job it is to sit in a, behind a bar and pull beer can't do it because you're not allowed into the bar. Um, our university lecturers, we've had to, you know, with some of these jobs can be done remotely but lots have simply been unavailable. And, and what's happened, that, that output is lost to us forever. And what's happened though during the pandemic, as uh, Danielle was saying, is uh, the people who are doing those jobs under normal conditions, <laughs> excuse me, under normal conditions simply wouldn't be paid and we have, we then, they would be bearing the cost. Instead, the government has paid them uh, through JobKeeper and, uh, and JobSeeker uh, so that their standard of living hasn't fallen dramatically and at the same time hasn't taken anything from the rest of us, those who are still employed. And so uh, 
that's the first stage when essentially lots of people are simply locked out of their jobs. And that's going to continue for some people well in the future. International borders are going to be closed for quite some time to come. Uh, we've seen job losses in the university sector. Uh, but um, we could hope that uh, by Christmas, say, the really bad job losses associated with lockdowns and other restrictions were behind us. We then move into a much more, a much more classic type of recession where uh, because of because of disruption caused by the crisis, uh, lots of people haven't managed to hold in their jobs, lots of businesses have shut, uh, and if the government turns off the tap for fiscal stimulus, we have a classic situation where there are people willing to work, able to work now because the uh, we've got the pandemic more or less under control, uh, but there's no one willing willing to pay pay for them. And finally, there's a third stage. If that gets done reasonably fast, which may still happen, there's a third stage which is all the people who uh, worked through the worked through the pandemic, who kept on getting their income, have a whole pile of money in the bank. Uh, for people who didn't, of course, are dealing with the banks uh, trying to defer their loans, but on in total, people have been paying down their credit cards, paying down their mortgages, because uh, we, those of us who are, are still working, are getting money, but we can no longer spend it. We can't go, uh, we certainly, you know, living in Queensland, you know, can't go to any other state, can't go overseas, uh, we can, of course, see beautiful Queensland, but um, uh, that's, um, that's great. But And for, for a significant period, uh, we couldn't go out to dinner or do lots of the things that we would like to do. That money that we would have spent just piles up in our bank account. And we get to the third stage, uh, which is if everybody tries to spend that money and we have everybody back at work, uh, we'll have excess demand. The money we'll have, uh, we won't be able to meet those demands. Uh, we can either deal with that by inflation, if we just let people spend the money, inflation will happen, or we can introduce taxation that will redistribute that so that the cost is borne, uh, the cost is borne evenly uh, across it. So that the people who essentially didn't suffer any income loss during the recession uh, pay for a substantial share of the support that was given uh, to those who, who lost, lost their jobs. Now, um, what we're seeing, unfortunately, is from the government is a great deal of confusion because they're talking about bringing forward permanent tax cuts, targeted high income earners who are mostly this group, uh, which neither stimulate the economy because they'll only, they'll only be brought forward by a year or two, uh, but also uh, cripple the idea of, of, uh, of those people making a contribution to the, to the cost. Uh, now, I've been asked, uh, asked to talk a little bit about opportunity costs. I, I, broadly speaking, I uh, endorse the points that uh, Daniela's made. I guess I would only say, in my view, the low bond rates aren't now. If we have a 30-year bond rate that's at uh, that's at effectively zero, that says that people expect those rates to stay very low for a very long time into the future. And I think uh, without it, unless we greatly expand government debt, I think we can treat the cost of government borrowing as being very, very low. And that's, that's important in terms of spreading the cost of this over, over a long period into the future. Uh, so I asked about opportunity costs, which is the theme of my marvellous book, Economics in Two Lessons, which I'll uh, get a plug in for. And it's, it's relevant, uh, opportunity cost in general is what you give up in order to uh, have something else, the, be the best alternative to you. If I'm thinking of going to um, Malulaba for my vacation, uh, the opportunity cost, under my current circumstances, is the Gold Coast. It isn't anywhere south of the border because I can't go there. Uh, but I could go. I could go to the Gold Coast instead of all the bar. Uh, so uh, that's that's the, that's the ordinary concept of opportunity cost. When we talk about unemployment in a standard recession, we have a lot of people willing to work who are, don't have anything very useful to do at home. Uh, the opportunity cost of re-employing these people is very low, and that's why uh, that's why opportunity cost is relevant here. Whereas if we have essentially a fully employed economy where most of the time, if the government decides we need more nurses in, a, in our aged care, aged care sector, uh, they can't go down to the queue of unemployed people and say, you look like you'd be a good nurse, we'll hire you. They have to bid, they have to hire somebody who uh, might be working as a nurse or might be a qualified nurse working in some other job. Uh, there isn't a big pool of unemployed people who meet the skills that we need. And in that context, therefore, the opportunity cost is the work that that person otherwise would have uh, would have done. Now, I was also asked to say something about modern monetary theory, which I approach with trepidation. So I'll give two versions of it. Uh, 
both extreme versions, but um, uh, uh, one, yeah, uh, one right and one wrong. So the first one, which is right, is essentially what I just said. Uh, and what that says is, uh, when we think about uh, when we think about governments supplying, governments undertaking public spending, we shouldn't think of the role of tax as financing that public spending. We should think of it as ensuring that the resources needed for that public spending are available. Uh, if we have the situation, for example, as I indicate in the future, where the economy is more or less bounced back, uh, people have bank accounts flush with money, and then the government gives those people a tax cut, the money, their desire to spend money runs straight into uh, the demands of the public sector to to fulfil goals, and we end up with uh, we end up with inflation. Uh, so, uh, so basically, it says treat taxation as a way of providing resources that, when they're needed, not as an accounting exercise in in making funds. Uh, that's uh, that's my version of of what's correct. I don't think any MMT person would actually say, look, yeah, that's all there is to it. They they're going to insist there's something new, and the extreme version of there's something new is. Look, we can have all the goodies we want. The government's got its own printing press there. Uh, if we wanted to just double GDP tomorrow, it's just a matter of printing enough dollars and everything will be well. And maybe inflation will come along sometime, but let's just not worry about that until it happens. Uh, those are two caricature versions of it. Some MMT people are very close to the second version I just gave. Uh, some are much closer to the first version. Uh, what I would say is the correct version is reformulation of the standard Keynesian view of the world where you can have unemployed resources uh, and um, you can also have uh, you can also have situations of full employment it's a useful reformulation in some ways it doesn't fundamentally change the choices it's not a, a magic new discovery Abelina was writing about this in 1944 and no one at the time said well we can have a Nobel Prize and probably should never have got one but certainly nobody said we should give this guy the Nobel Prize. And also nobody said we should drum this guy out of the economic profession. He's a crank. Everybody at the time saw that this was a way, an interesting way of repackaging the emerging Keynesian orthodoxy. Uh, so those are those two points. Um, I've used most of my 10 minutes, so I'll stop there and we can go on to uh, the next questions. That was excellent. Thank you very much, John. And I appreciate the historical economic shade that I did not understand, but I'm sure entirely relevant people who understand economics better than I do. Um, so you touched on MMT already. We might come to that a bit later if we can. I'd like to get Daniel to have a quick explanation for us. Um, you've written a lot about intergenerational economics. Uh, and this is what piqued my interest in um, the work that Grattan yourself was writing about during the pandemic, given the focus of that concept on equity. Can you give us a quick explanation of that concept of intergenerational economics and how it does reflect um, so relate to equity, and do you think this holds enough sway in contemporary policy making? Yeah. Oh, either uh, that was to Danielle, but if you have you want to jump in, you can. You're muted, Danielle. Thank you. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself, but it kept saying the host wasn't allowing me to. So that's I, was, I was, I promise, it wasn't me. <laughs> that's why I was doing charades there. <laughs> um, so look, um, intergenerational economics. Well, I, look, I think an intergenerational frame is one way to think about policy. It's certainly not the only lens you should use, um, but I think it is um, an important one, particularly around discussions of, of equity. Um, but overall, when we talk about inequality, um, you know, they're, they're very difficult discussions, they're very value-based discussions. Um, if I put an economic frame around it, um, you know, you're talking about to what extent are you willing to trade off um, incentives um, and rewards for, for effort and work um, for greater equality in the distribution. And, you know, different people will make that trade off in different ways. Um, I think it's actually more clear cut in a way to talk about generational inequality um, because you don't come up against those trade offs. Uh, I can't think of any principled reason um, that you should say that one generation should be able to cut the pie or transfer to themselves in a way that disadvantages another generation. Um, of course, there's, you know, you get a lot of overlap between the two 
concept. So when you have a world with very pronounced intergenerational inequality, uh, it probably means that you have, for example, disadvantaged young people are particularly badly off, which is essentially the world we've been in for the past decade. Um, does it hold sway in policy making? I think it, it has certainly infiltrated policy discussions in recent times. And you know, if I think back to the last election, um, the Labor government was certainly talking about their agenda in intergenerational terms. So um, the franking credits policy, um, their policies around negative gearing and the capital gains tax were very much framed around um, sustainability of government budget positions and housing affordability, which are kind of two um, intergenerational issues. Um, so I think it can work in the public debate. What I've seen is, you know, I think that argument, you know, do you want your children to be better off resonates, um, but you often see people framing that in terms of their own children. Um, so my children will be okay because I'm gonna leave them a house and this and that, as opposed to my children's generation. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I think that that is the, the real challenge in this debate, not just thinking about um, your own descendants, but the, the, the whole generation that comes after them. And, you know, in the, in the aftermath of this pandemic, um, you know, as I said, we don't think we have to worry about debt just yet, but there will be some point where we turn back to fiscal consolidation. And I think the choices we make then about how we do that uh, will be really important for this issue. Thank you. And I've seen, John, you're answering some of the questions live, which is awesome. And I might try and get to ask them again live in a second if we can. Um, question for both of you, and this relates exactly to how government has you know, targeted its spending stimulus and social support for the pandemic. Uh, JobKeeper and JobSeeker have both aimed to apply a sort of conditionality to payments. Uh, in doing so, I guess we can say they've been exposed to issues of complexity, uh, competing incentives for business owners and individuals, and uh, importantly, lack of coverage. In this context, how might an unconditioned payment compare as effective pandemic support now and in the future as we look to JobKeeper being diminished in the next month or so? To both of you. Sorry, we're, we're both stuck on mute again. <laughs> it's like being in a class box. Do you want to go first, John, and then I'll yeah. go? So an important point is that uh, Job Seeker has greatly reduced the conditionality, the compliance pressure that was associated with, uh, uh, with New Start. Um, that's a step in the right direction, but I think, um, I think we could go a great deal further and uh, with a group of colleagues I've released with ANU, a, a proposal for a livable income guarantee, which would essentially extend uh, a replacement for job seeker, ideally set set equal to the age pension and with with similar income conditionality to the age pension, uh, but extended to cover a range of activities, including voluntary work, uh, childcare, uh, full time study, uh, potentially things like starting a small business, uh, artistic and creative work. Uh, so a much larger range of activities that are seen as providing a potential contribution to the community. And that's based on a bunch of, a bunch of things. It, it's not so much uh, a robot will take my job as in a modern economy, the link between, uh, the link between what you produce and market output it has become much looser than it was in the past. You look at a company like Google, it doesn't produce anything as News Limited point out. It uh, takes their stuff, but also of course it takes my stuff. Uh, I'm not getting any, I mean, I would perfectly happily throw Google off my um, my uh, off my uh, off my search results. I can't do that. Google and Facebook and all these companies are, are living off what we do. Now that's not you know, I'm not making moral criticism of them simply on that basis, but making the point that uh, that the whole notion of a job is a time specific notion that emerged in the 19th century, flourished in the 20th century, is, is becoming. Is becoming less relevant. So I think, I think without going, uh, without going to the various ideals that people have put off of an unconditional payment received by everybody in the community, which is a utopian, uh, we could do something like this for amounts 
of $20 billion a year, which used to sound pretty eye-watering, but now we toss those around like confetti. And, um, uh, and so, so this is something we could do uh, if we chose as a community to go that way. There's no sign, unfortunately, that the, the government, I think, seems to have just run out of originality. It's just, just drifting back to the stuff it knows, knows from the past, but, but I hope to see some change there. Um, I'll just follow on from that, as I think, um, you know, I'm not a fan of the universal income idea, um, largely because I think if you do that, it has to be set at a sufficient level for um, the most disadvantaged and vulnerable and those that aren't working. Uh, and if you pay that amount to everyone in the community, um, you do get you get to truly eye watering sums, not 20 million, but um, many, many, many multiples of that. Um, and then it does become hard to, to finance. Um, but you know, what are you trying to achieve with the UBI? You are trying to achieve a robust uh, safety net for people that aren't in paid employment. Um, so you know, the the most minimalistic way you could do that is just set new start at a basic rate and get rid of some of the more punitive conditions. Um, I think of the scheme that John just articulated, which I think is a really um, yeah, interesting proposal is kind of the next level of that is saying, you know, this is not just people that are technically unemployed, but they may be doing other types of caring activities or other things. Um, and to me, they seem like more sensible ways to, to get at the problem we're trying to get at um, rather than a UBI. Um, the other thing I would say is I, you know, I think JobKeeper is not just about income support. I think it's, it, it served a really important function um, during the shutdown phase of the pandemic, which was about keeping people connected to, to jobs. Um, so even workers that had been stood down were still on the payroll of their employers. That's really important for the recovery because it means um, as soon as that business opens again, those people can go back to the work that they were doing before. Um, and then when businesses open, it acts as a, as a wage subsidy. Um, so we saw um, a lot of businesses being quite innovative during the shutdown periods. You know, a lot of businesses finding ways to transition to doing things online or your local cafe, you know, doing cooking classes or, or takeaways or whatever it is. Uh, and they were incentivized to do that because of the design of the job keeper scheme. Um, and, and that, you know, also means that the hit, the economic hit will be smaller than it otherwise would have been and that we will recover faster. So I think it, it, it's doing actually a bit more than just income support. I muted myself there. Um, <laughs> fun. Thank you both for your answers. That's really interesting. And I'd like to follow on from that point you've touched on about how local you know, small business Australia has adapted as we've gone through. Uh, the Grattan Institute was quite strong very early on about hard closures uh, and maintaining those hard closures until you had, you know, process of elimination of mm. community trans transmission of the virus. Uh, and then, you know, looking at how that affects long term second and third waves, or ideally avoids them. Given the recent commentary in politics in the media about the need to open back up slowly bit by bit, um, criticism of Premier Daniel Andrews staged approach. Does the Grattan Institute and do you both personally stand by or do you agree with the idea still that we need to maintain a harsh shutdown now and then aim for elimination? Um, so look, the answer is, is yes, we're, we're sort of broadly supportive of that approach. Um, we've stopped using the term elimination as I think most people have because um, you, know, you can never truly eliminate but you know if, if to pick up the, the language of the national cabinet if you like radical suppression um, which is essentially aiming for the zero active um, community cases um, I think that is still the right goal I mean what I would say is we are obviously operating in an environment of a huge amount of uncertainty and there are still unknowns um, so I think um, nobody can put their hand on the heart and say they know for sure what the, <laughs> the right answer is, but you know, governments have to make a call. And um, I think therefore, as people that participate in the policy debate, we should make our own calls as well on, on the balance of the evidence. Um, what I would say is cross country data, um, some interesting um, you know, cross state comparisons in the US um, all suggest that the countries that perform best economically are the ones that get the health situation under control. So. The actually the worst thing for the economy is the virus spreading unconstrained. Um, 
you know, a more interesting debate that has arisen, I think, is, you know, can you operate in a world where the virus is bubbling through at low levels in the community? Um, is that the kind of happy medium? Um, and, you know, the reason why we've said we should go for zero rather than, than that world, which kind of is probably the, where New South Wales is at the moment, is that while that's happening, there's always a risk. Um, so this doesn't kind of spread in a, a nice smooth exponential pattern. Um, you have these sort of super spreader events. So just by luck, um, you know, you'll have someone in a crowded workplace that has it. Um, and then all of a sudden your case numbers blow up. It can be hard to contain through contact tracing. Um, so given where we're at, given that zero is potentially achievable, which is just not in a lot of other places, um, we think it makes sense to go to aim for it. Um, yes, it will mean more short-term economic pain, and certainly in Melbourne, uh, you know, none of us wanted to stay um, in, in stage four for longer. But you know, the potential longer-term economic upside is so big of being able to much more safely reopen, um, contain any new case that pops up, hopefully, uh, without further lockdowns. That you know, I think on balance. Um, and given the risk profiles, that that is the right thing to be aiming for. Yeah, I mean, I broadly agree. I think there's uh, points of detail where I, I think we're not getting the balance right. For example, masks are low cost and reduce the. It mean that we get if we have a straight, if we have a low level community transmission, uh, which we and we never know that we don't. Uh, we have um, uh, we have a line of defence there that 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 essentially costs very little and, and, and would enable us to do other things. Uh, we had in the Queensland case, one case of somebody who took a fat crowded ferry. Fortunately, she was wearing a mask and it appears there weren't any other follow-on cases uh, from that. And certainly air transport is a bit of it, but I think it's something which is a very small sacrifice compared to the costs of a, a failed uh, suppression strategy. And I think, I think the whole hotel quarantine thing has been a disaster. Uh, we've sort of evolved ourselves to a worse position than we were back, back at Wuhan when we flew people. The, the second Wuhan evacuation was to an air base in the Northern Territory. Now, if you're going to be locked away, there's no merit in being locked away in a hotel in, in a major city. We might as well have more people come back, have the government do it. And I suppose that's, that's I think, the one lesson we've learned is having for-profit providers in any kind of human services we knew it was a disaster. It was a disaster with TAFE. It was a disaster. We've now found it's a disaster with aged care. It was a disaster with quarantine. Uh, basically, uh, we should uh, we should completely do away with for-profit provision of private service uh, of human services, unless unless uh, the provider can guarantee that they'll do as good a job as as public sector employees will be employed on the same conditions as public sector employees, and so forth, which I think would wipe out all the cost savings that we'll see. But yeah, so I think we could change things, but there really isn't much difference between aggressive suppression and elimination. You, if you want, you try and hold it at zero, as long as it's at zero, you have elimination. When a case sneaks through, you go back to active suppression. But um, those are, are really modest changes, I think. Um, yeah, just rambling on slightly. The people who oppose this essentially have in mind the equivalent of what Mohammed McGavick called the paper nuclear reactor. It's the one that's safe and cheap and generates electricity that's too, too cheap to meter. They want the suppression policy that always works, that has an incredibly low case, case fatality rate, uh, where the disease doesn't cause any long-term complications and where there aren't any mental health as aspects because no one worries too much about a bunch of old people dying a bit before their time. I think we really have made the right choice in broad terms as far as the suppression strategy goes. And, and just to add to what John said, you know, they're all kind of in there and assuming that in that world, the economy looks back like it was pre-COVID as well. Mm -hmm. So I think there's kind of just a, um, a lack of willingness to engage with the fact that there is no good yeah. counterfactual yeah. in this debate. <laughs> there's a yeah, false exactly. a false dichotomy between yeah. the, the health and the, the economic choices. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, that leads me to the next point, and I'm loath to use your cliche of econo um, economists not agreeing, but... We were discussing before we launched the event, uh, you and three other economists were in a garden out together discussing um, generally similar ideas about it shutting down. Professor Gigi Foster from UNSW has recently been quite vocal in advocating, I guess, what you could call the Sweden model, which is exactly that of letting it rip through the economy. 
and then assuming a herd immunity, uh, the economy opens up faster. Why is there such a disparity of opinion on this issue, given you both are quite strongly in agreement that it's not the right opinion? Um, well, first, I think, I mean, there's a lot of misconceptions about the Sweden model. Sweden is a very different country to Australia. In Sweden, you don't need police to drag people out of cars and bash them over the head. The minister, for whatever, gets on the TV and says, would everybody please stay home? And everybody does stay home. And the guts, that's really, the guts of what Sweden did is the same stuff as we did, only voluntary instead of compulsory. They made one difference, which was pretty catastrophic, which was they let bars open, and then let the people from those bars go and visit their grannies in, in uh, aged care homes. So they had thousands and thousands of deaths arising from that. But most people didn't. I saw something suggesting current activity of social activity, something like 30% of the pre-crisis level. So if you ignore the voluntary part of it, they did the same as everybody else did, and they suffered the same economic consequences. They had a drop in GDP just the same as other nearby countries in the same circumstance. But the trick people do is to say, let's look at Italy, they did so much better than Italy. But we and Sweden and Norway had plenty of warning. The Italians were hit out of nowhere by a disease they had nothing, no, yeah, they had no preparation for. Sweden hasn't gained any economic benefit at all from uh, the strategy it's pursued, uh, and it's, it's had thousands of unnecessary deaths. Uh, and also, I mean, I must say, you know, Judy Foster hasn't been open to evidence. She, she, a large part of her claim was the lives we saved through lockdown will be lost in additional suicides. When the sui and things of that kind. When the suicides didn't materialise, she didn't do the intellectually honest thing and say, oh, well, actually, sorry, I was wrong about that. She just went on repeating the same, same stuff. And while everybody's guilty of that to some extent, I've found the anti-lockdown people in this debate are on a par with climate deniers in terms of their just unwillingness to drop, you know, their willingness to jump from one talking point to another in support of essentially a preconceived position. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I think, I mean, I think the, the real blind spot is that question of what the economy looks like under the, the counterfactual. And I've, <laughs> I've, I've not seen anyone you know, really engage with that when they're pushing the Swedish model. The fact, as, as John has already said, that they had similar economic hit to um, similar nearby countries. Um, and, you know, you have to think in, in the long run, um, you know, they're, they're in a worse, um, they're in a much worse place. Um, the, the only, um, you know, if I were to view their argument in the, in the kindest light, which I think is always a good thing to do, um, there is, I think, the question with radical suppression or elimination of how long does this go for? Um, and so if you think, you know, there will be a vaccine or a treatment in the next couple of years, I think it, you know, to me clearly looks like the best strategy. But of course, that's a question mark. Um, we don't know that's the case. And, you know, if, if you're then talking five years, 10 years, um, you know, there are costs, obviously, with having your borders closed and having to run people through quarantine and all those sort of things. Um, now, Sweden's a long way from herd immunity. Um, so I think the best estimates suggest that, you know, less than 5% of the population have, have had the disease. So it's a very long way to, to get to 60% plus that you, you need for herd immunity. But, you know, if, if you never had a vaccine, you know, maybe in 10 years, um, that maybe we would say that they did pursue the right strategy. But I think that's an unlikely outcome. Thank you. And John, you mentioned quickly uh, the issue around private provision of care and in particularly social services, essential services, including healthcare and quarantines in this circumstance. Looking into the future of what government might be and what services the government might provide as opposed to now, do you think the pandemic has really highlighted a fact that there is some issues with how we provide essential services now, whether it be the you know, education, health, and even wider things past the pandemic like uh, corrections. Do you think this pandemic and the plight of aged care right now will change the perception of what government should be providing and how big or small or what services, you know, what's the role of government in the future? Well, I think of course, aged care was already a scandal even before the, um, before the pandemic. So I think, uh, I think, it's clear that the reforms introduced under Howard government back in the 90s have been a disaster, as of course were the, the TAFE reforms, whether that will uh, end, I could point to a long list of things of that kind. 
how much that will change things is hard to know, but certainly, um, certainly again, the comparison between the limited number of publicly operated aged care facilities in Victoria and the, and the, and the private ones is, is telling. I think it's, it's important to remember it's, it's a combination of public provision, but also employment conditions that what we've discovered uh, what we've discovered is having lots of workers without sick leave is a really bad idea and we should have known that um, I should have known that before and we've been taking 3,000 deaths a year unnecessarily in large measure from influenza because uh, rather than saying people have sick leave and should stay home they say they should take some codril and soldier on and I suppose one of my policies would be to confiscate all the assets of Johnson and Johnson and say you can pay for the uh, you can pay for the uh, uh, the costs of that campaign, but uh, but certain, certainly that was just an utterly crazy notion, which the absence of sick leave made has continues to make incredibly problematic. So, so services like this should be provided by workers who are on proper award conditions, have sick leave, and who are under orders not to turn up when they feel sick because they're they're dealing with um, other things. I suppose I I should add, obviously, the vaccination issue also comes in here and, and is going to be uh, is going to be problematic though I think not as problematic in Australia as other places I think Australia is perfectly cool with compulsion list and um, uh, but yeah that, that, that we, for a long while we didn't even require health workers to, to be vaccinated against against influenza which was just crazy. Cool um, thank you very much for that. Building on from the point of what government's role should be in the future, do you, we think government has a responsibility here to provide what many have been calling a green recovery or build back better? There's a few variations on the theme, essentially the idea that we have an opportunity now and as a young Australian, it's quite important to me that we do achieve some certain outcomes, be they emissions, be they social justice, as part of this recovery. What do you think governments need to do now? And Daniel touched on uh, some of the priority areas for investment. What should the governments, I guess, number one, two, three priorities be right now for ensuring that decisions we make now broadly do benefit the future and tick some of those boxes, being a green recovery, et cetera? Um, so I think it will be a, a package of things. Um, and I, I think, um, so, you know, they should be essentially using a couple of criteria. So one is, you know, ultimately this is about trying to create jobs. So are these things that are going to be creating jobs? Um, but can we also deliver something socially valuable as part of that? Um, so the green recovery is interesting. Um, you know, I'm a huge proponent of climate action. And I think there are some things that, that fall into the bucket of, um, you know, good stimulus that deliver a green dividend. Um, so, you know, there I would point to um, things like um, sustainability retrofits for public buildings, um, you know, good support for the construction sector, delivers something green in the long term, um, rolling out smart meters more broadly, some um, environmental rehabilitation, you know, really good at creating jobs. Um, where I'm more sceptical and where I think a lot of people talk about is this, you know, this idea that you do big support for renewable energy as, as green recovery. I think, um, you know, there is already good incentives there and in the market for, for investment in renewables. I think, you know, to the extent the government has a role, it's actually to create the policy frameworks and the settings that are going to allow those investments um, to, to occur. So that's, you know, creating a, a proper um, framework that puts a, a price on carbon in some form or another. Um, you know, helping adapt the, the energy system and, you know, the transmission system to be able to bring in those renewables. Um, you know, I think that's the kind of thing we should be looking at there rather than talking about direct government investment in renewables. Um, of course, the thing we really don't want to do <laughs> is lock in um, government investments um, in um, fossil fuels <laughs> in, um, in the name of recovery. And, you know, that's essentially... Uh, the announcement we saw today. So I think that that is a, a real concern. I mean, going in the exact opposite direction and talking about government investments in, in gas, um, you know, get new gas power generation, I think doesn't make a lot of sense. It isn't consistent with the, the model that the government's been putting about being technology agnostic. 
Um, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, I suppose if we had a carbon price, I'd agree, but I, I don't. I think we don't have one, and um, and it's probably too late to uh, probably too late to make it make it work. So I guess I'm uh, I'm at this point of the view that it has to be done uh, directly. Uh, it obviously won't be done by the current government willingly. I think our best chance is that. Um, our international trading partners force us to do it by mm. imposing taxes on our exports, which as a country we absolutely deserve. Um, and China also deserves it and they will get it. So, um, uh, so I see no real prospect for positive action. Uh, the government is actively obstructing, um, actively obstructing development of renewables and, and until very recently and in large measure continuing, uh, the people running the electricity uh, grid system uh, still have their minds stuck in the coal era and and but to the extent they don't they're tweaking prices in a situation where we have this gigantic distortion of no carbon price so what we should do is clear i think um uh, but what we will do i think is nothing just based on that how likely do you think it is that major trading partners china eu etc will start to impose a green levy on australian goods and services uh, EU, quite likely. I mean, at, or, or more precisely, that we won't get the trade agreement we want with the EU uh, without such a, uh, while we don't have a carbon price. So that cost will be borne. Uh, in the case of the US and assuming a Biden administration, I think um, I think it won't it won't be done directly to us, but it could be a byproduct of of the continuing trade war with China. Uh, that um, that's something where it can easily point out the Chinese are cheating. Um, and the fact the Americans have been cheating for a long time will be conveniently forgotten. Uh, so I could easily see that happening. But certainly with the EU, I think uh, we can forget about having a trade agreement with the EU unless uh, unless we do something. But I don't think the government is thinking that far. Well, the government, I think, is still stuck inside an Australian political mould where they can't believe anybody would actually do such a thing. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, we might start opening up the questions from the floor in our Q&A chat. So if you are watching along, make sure you're putting your good questions into the Q&A box. And remember, you can upvote uh, questions you want to hear answered. Uh, if the questions are very long and I don't understand them on first read through, then I'll apologise and we'll probably skip over those for the, uh, for the brevity of the evening. Some very smart questions about Phillips curve trade-offs that I don't understand. So I might just some relative to the next one. Uh, I want to start with a sort of broad uh, from anonymous question looking, I guess, long-term and quite high in the sky about a youth guarantee. And I assume it's applying to a youth job or employment guarantee and its validity as a policy to address skyrocketing youth unemployment. And I'm assuming particularly post COVID, as Daniel mentioned, the uh, scarring effect of recession takes hold. Um, so it, it, it partly depends what you mean by a youth guarantee, but I do get a bit concerned about the jobs guarantee uh, concept largely because it ends up looking a bit like work for the doll in a different um, different package um, so if it's um, sort of an, an obligation that um, you know if you're not in the paid workforce and you're receiving some government benefits then um, there is a job that the government is going to create for you um, Generally, they don't look like good jobs, um, and particularly, you know, given the you know full range of um, skills that participants will potentially have, um, quite often they haven't been really meaningful jobs. They haven't been jobs that are taking you on a path to get paid employment in the future. Um, so I think you know it's quite an interesting debate and one where um, you know the, there's a sort of a, a strong left position and a strong right position. Um, essentially arguing for the same thing at its core, but with a very different vision about what it looks like. I'm just not convinced in the capacity of the government to deliver significant, you know, the number of jobs that you would need that would be meaningful um, in any way that to, to, to properly run a jobs guarantee like that. Um, uh, so what I would like to see is, you know, far as I, as I sort of said, I think, you know, stimulus focused on, um, you know, targeted wage subsidies and things to actually get young people into work, I think is incredibly important. 
Yeah, so I'm more sympathetic to the idea of a job guarantee, I think, um, partly because I see a big need for expanded public sector employment. So, so um, and um, um, in terms of the Phillips curve, which is the supposed trade-off between unemployment and inflation, I think, um, I mean, it's a complicated story, but the guts of my position is uh, there's nothing to suggest we couldn't lower the rate of unemployment substantially uh, while keeping inflation at levels that uh, IP, that I think would make good rate of sense. I think we should be looking at an inflation target of 4% or so anyway. Uh, so, um, uh, so, and um, uh, that's also relevant to the rate at which we can pay off debt, uh, allows us to have a substantially negative real rate of interest. Uh, so I think, I think we could introduce a policy which was primarily about uh, direct expansion of public sector employment, included some wage subsidy elements for the private sector, and then had uh, a residual component that was more like what's envisaged when we think of uh, when we think of uh, direct job uh, job creation or job guarantee of jobs that are specifically designed uh, and targeted unemployed people, as opposed to just just trying to expand employment. Uh, expand employment across the board. That also, I, I think, uh, would entail a reversal of a lot of the corporatisation of, of public enterprises, in the, of public activity, in the sense of saying, one of your one of your objectives is to create jobs. I don't want to hear from you about how you've managed to uh, reduce headcount and so forth. I don't, you know, I don't, the, the model I think we've had of, of, uh, of essentially making government run like business has failed in all sorts of respects uh, and you know we've seen the failures of it in the pandemic. Given your, um, given your mildly differing views on a job guarantee, if the solution is not a promise of a job, is it then the promise of education? And if so, whose responsibility is it to make sure that everyone is receiving that education and how do you do it? Um, so governments have certainly set that as targets for themselves that, you know, that young, the kind of the, their earning or learning, um, that, that, that sort of model. Um, so the question is, you know, yeah, how do you deliver the courses that are going to give people the skills that will then actually help them get into work? Um, and I think that is a really important discussion coming out of this. And I was heartened early on to see um, Scott Morrison sort of stressing the need for reform for the skills sector. Um, and, you know, John's already pointed out, it's been a, <laughs> a bit of a bloody schmozzle, quite frankly, particularly the vocational education and training sector. Um, so I think there is a lot of scope to provide greater support to that sector, to you know, help channel people into the sorts of skills that we know are gonna be in demand in the future. Um, the other component of education, of higher education, um, I do not know what the government's been doing in that space during this pandemic. It's been uh, a very strange set of policies, um, you know, sort of almost deliberately reconfiguring the rules so that universities couldn't access JobKeeper, which we know has led to a significant number of job losses in the sector. Um, the changes to fees, um, the, the job ready graduates package um, is one of the worst pieces of public policy design I've, I've seen. Um, you know, even if you agreed with the underlying objectives of the scheme, it, it certainly doesn't deliver on those objectives or doesn't come close to it. Um, so, you know, I think there is a lot the government could do in the education space, but um, I think particularly on higher education, there's been some really strange choices that have been made of late. Yeah, my view is we need a much more fundamental transformation. I mean, we, are, we have a system which is, in essence, is inherited from period when maybe 5% of young people went to university, when universities were essentially private charities created by an act of parliament, but um, uh, you know, we have 39 whatever it is universities all competing with each other, paying their chief executives millions of dollars and ad, you know, spending a lot of money marketing into each other and we wouldn't tolerate this with ordinary schools or police services. If somebody said, you know, if Police Station X started advertising saying, come to our police station, uh, we'll give you better service than the police station down the road. And if your suburb doesn't have a police station, well, you're out of luck, maybe, maybe somewhere we'll create one. We have this ludicrous patchwork of 
of institutions which belong really in the 19th century. We should have an expectation, as we have with, as we introduced in the 19th century with school and have pushed out in year 12, that everybody should have post school education, whether it's uh, VET or whether it's TAFE or, 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 or university, and that the presumption should be that that should be public education. Uh, you know, we should basically treat universities and, and, and TAFE as the post, post year 12 years of education and assume that that's what everybody needs and then deal with the people, find, find schemes to deal with the residual of people who, who, want to, who don't find themselves fitting into either of those categories. But jobs for those people are disappearing. We, should be, we shouldn't be saying learning or learning, we should be saying learning in my view. For you, is that an expansion of existing HEX support or a move towards a more free tertiary education model? Well, because it was universal, uh, then, the, then the, you know, it's, it's largely a question of when in your life you pay it. Um, yeah, the case for HEX is, again, that we have this residual system where if somebody, some state government chooses to set up a university somewhere and people choose to go, uh, we'll, give, we'll, we'll give them some money. That's been paid for the people, by the people who didn't go or didn't get in because there's no guarantee. Yeah, you know, we don't have a guarantee that you can go to university. It's just if if one of these 39 charities decides to let you in, that's great. If they don't, uh, some of the time, some of the time it's their choice. Sometimes it's the government's choice. If everybody could go, if we had this, if we had a situation where everybody was guaranteed a post school education, we could find some kind of endowment to give to the minority of people who didn't do that. We could do something like set up a small business. And we wouldn't. We could make it free because everybody would be paying it back in the course of their working life. Thank you. Uh, quick question: GDP, and to summarise, yay or nay? Is it a useful measure of anything? GDP. Yep. Yeah, it's a useful measure of economic activity. If you're the Reserve Bank trying to work out whether whether the economy is moving along or not. Uh, GDP works very well. Uh, it's not a useful measure of economic of welfare of any kind. Um, largely agree. I mean, it is. It's certainly correlated with um, well-being and welfare. And I think um, you know most studies suggest there there is a correlation. But obviously, there are you know a lot of things that it misses that are incredibly important for for, for well-being and a good life. So. Um, should government look at it? Yes. Um, should it be the only thing or the sole objective? No. Uh, and you know, there's, there's a lot of a lot of countries moving to you know broader sets of indicators. I, I, you know, I think the New Zealand model is a really interesting one, the wellbeing framework, and um, and why I think I you know I like the New Zealand one not just because of the things it emphasises, but because of the way they've really integrated it into their decision making processes. So, you know, public servants, when they're putting up budget proposals, they're told, um, you know, you must look at the impact across all these um, different dimensions that we've chosen to emphasise. So, you know, the only way that you actually get it taken seriously is if you make it fundamental when you're making policy decisions, um, that, that you embrace that framework in your assessments. Um, so that it's a, it's a pretty significant change, I think, and, and one that we should be looking at. To give my bomb now on the subject, only three things wrong with GDP. It's gross, it's domestic, and it's, and it's a problem. <laughs> what I mean by that is it doesn't count depreciation. So uh, if half if half of Sydney is destroyed in bushfires, uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't appear in GDP, quite rightly from the point of view of the Reserve Bank, because the houses weren't doing any work. Uh, it's domestic, which means that the money we pay to foreign-owned mining companies is part of GDP. Uh, and finally, it's in the product accounts when what we care about is income. So even without doing anything new, if we cared about welfare, the ABS could publish, could headline the net national income figure, yep. which is in yep. the national accounts and overcome all those problems. And do it that, on a per person basis as well. <laughs> they choose not to. I mean, I think it's, it's an indictment of statistical agencies mm. that rather than putting to, rather than putting to ordinary people the figure that's relevant and telling the Reserve Bank, look, we know you we know you rather have GDP, but we also know you have trained economists who can look to page three and find it. Uh, they always they they report GDP. But the fact that we've kept on doing that without without ever changing it tells us this isn't and shouldn't be considered as a welfare measure. Mm, and I think you know that 
becomes really important in certain policy debates, like the company tax debate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you see all the modelling focusing on, you know, what will be the impact of a company tax cut on GDP? Yeah. Um, it looks very different if you, if you yeah. look at it in terms of, of, of G&I. Yeah, if you look um, at the end, it's totally different because, yeah, we're saying, yeah, sure, we'll get lots of foreign investment and that will increase our, our total output. The fact that all of that money goes overseas again um, is, is ignored. And that was, I think, the big failing in the Henry report that they, they looked at GDP. When they, they made wrong analyses based on GDP. Yeah. So, the, yeah, the measure does matter. <laughs> it drives decisions. And I ask uh, from a point of personal conflict because volunteer organisations, NGOs, we don't count all the hours we put into events like these. Um, yeah, exactly. Given you mentioned New Zealand as a good case study for embedding that framework, I guess, into their policy agenda, do you think any country has really emerged from this crisis as one to watch or a really standout model for what we should be doing and how to do it well. Um, so I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. Obviously, the answer is be prepared. I mean, the countries that have done really well were Taiwan and Hong Kong, places that already knew what to do. And um, unfortunately, that's not very helpful advice because, well, it's not very helpful advice in the sense the next problem might be a different one. It is, I think, advice that says. The moment anybody uses the word alarmism or anything of that kind, we should dismiss them from public debate. Uh, the same people who said, don't worry about climate change, have also been the deniers on COVID. And they've also, and their, their underlying intuition is, look, people say all these terrible things will happen and they never do happen. Well, they have happened. And uh, so I think uh, that's the lesson we should have is, uh, we should be looking at, uh, looking at dangers where research suggests that they really are serious, we should be preparing for them rather than listening to uh, the kind of person who says, yeah, I've been here for 60 years and I've never seen a bushfire burner, a major city, uh, so I'm sure it can't happen. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. And I think, you know, the, some of those countries that John mentioned um, said it's, they, they have had pandemics in, in recent years and they, they were sort of fast to, to roll out a plan. Um, they also had very effective systems. Um, so I think it is, you know, th there's a real point in here about, um, you know, the, the public service um, readiness. Um, so, you know, good contract tracing, for example, um, you know, there's been a lot of comparisons made between Victoria and New South Wales, um, partly unfair, you know, it's just, you just can't contract trace at a certain when you've got a certain size outbreak. But um, it's true that Victoria had invested less in their systems and processes in that space. Um, so we, we just didn't have the same preparation that other places had. And it's a bloody high price. I think that's it. This is also a good reminder of, um, you know, when things go wrong, just how significant the, the broader cost can be. And bringing that back to the point about climate change action, maybe getting something out of this recovery effort that is climate focused, given you're both quite active in that debate, political discussion sphere, how do we get away from the voices that have been for 10, 20, 30 years saying the same thing, which has been disproven again and again? How do we get away from those people having... I wish I knew. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I think... Um, uh, no, I think, I think we have, as a country, uh, run ourselves into a dead end. Uh, we have to wait for somebody to come and kick our backside and, and get us out. Yeah, I mean, it's such a... It, look, I'm sure there's about a thousand PhD theses already been written and to be written on the topic, but it is, you know, it's such a strange debate um, here. Um, and the US in the way that it's just not in other parts of the world, that it has become such a kind of polarised left-right thing. Um, you know, wanting to protect the environment and leave the world a better place for our children should be a very conservative impulse. Um, it's, you know, interesting that it has just become um, this kind of tokenistic political issue and it's just entirely derailed the conversation. Um, so much so, I, I heard that... Um, and, and this is not confirmed, I don't know if anyone in this room knows about it, but um, 
that Labor are saying that they're going to go to the election without mm. climate targets. Yeah. I mean, I've said, I've said, I don't think they've said it, I've said it really, but it seems quite likely. Um, Which, you know, it just seems, you know, <laughs> gobsacking. And when you look, you know, if you, if you look at any of the opinion polls and the um, elect, electoral study um, post the last election, I mean, it, it wasn't climate change that, that cost them the election. There, there was a couple of seats where um, certainly there was a big swing, but, you know, overall, this is a very popular mm. issue. Um, I, I, you know, I just think that they're, they're misreading the political mood. And to be clear, you are talking federal labour, given yeah. that Queensland... Yeah, sorry. Soon. Yeah, yeah, good point, federal labour. And, they, you know, this has been... A, there has been, obviously, a really interesting um, mm. dichotomy between um, federal government and state governments on this, including state no, sorry, coalition sorry. governments, yeah, that are much, much more... Um, mm. willing to embrace action. Mm. Yeah, and we could talk about um, issues with coalition governments in New South Wales and certain koalas, but we might leave that uh, for another time. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question about donuts. Uh, EU is looking at the donut model, the donut model of circular economy feeding into a closed loop system has been getting quite a lot of traction. Do both of you have, at a high level, a view on that model taking place, its validity, are there any drawbacks? Um, I suppose I sort of, I mean, in a sense, uh, and I would ask this question also about, about growth, in a sense we're still focusing there on material throughput and most economy essentially has nothing to do with material throughput anymore. I mean, obviously a Zoom meeting requires some fiber optic cables and, and computers we have lying around, but when you try and think of this process, the economy is really in, in, in crucial ways moved beyond that. And I think, I mean, I think what's correct about it is we can have improved living standards without uh, increasing everything across the board, including material throughput. And I think that's the assumption that we have to have that is in some sense shared both by the, um, uh, the climate denialists who essentially say, have the view we can't possibly have improved living standards unless we keep on digging more stuff up, burning it, smelting it and so forth. Uh, there's also, I think, some part of that view uh, on the deep green side of the debate uh, with a different valence that we have to stop doing this and, and the only way to stop it is to have, have no more economic growth. So I think, I think we clearly can move in that direction, but I think in crucial respects, the action's already moved past the question, not the, past the notion of the economy, which starts with physical inputs as, as, the, primary, uh, as the primary activity. That's, yeah. A very secondary part. If we look at the kinds of things that have mattered in this crisis, things like contact, contact tracing, aged care, health services. I mean, obviously there's material stuff in there, but thinking, thinking, of, thinking of a doctor as somebody who processes medical instruments mm. uh, just just doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and I think that's so. I think in a sense we really need to just move away from that whole notion of a goods economy. Uh, entirely, that's that's how I would put it. Yeah, it's it's interesting um, the way in which that still very much pervades a lot of the a lot of the debates. I think this idea that um, you know making something, um, you know, manufacturing jobs are deeply superior to to you know eighty percent of us work in in services yeah. jobs and services industries. Um, and it's seen somehow as, you know, that's it's not the same contribution um, to the economy and to society as, as jobs that involve physically making things, which, I, you know, I think is a, a mindset that really needs to shift. Thank you. Quick question about debt. How do we get away from debt if we are trying to understand that debt not really as the pervasive issue that governments face when they're doing their budgets? And how can we make sure that doesn't stay as a main focus looking at long-term future planning? I think we need to um, spend more time educating economics journalists <laughs> is the conclusion that I've, I've come to. Um, you know, I, early on in this pandemic, you know, in, before, before they announced JobKeeper, but you know, after we'd seen those queues outside Centrelink, um, and we were talking about what governments can do. People were like, oh, but won't that, you know, won't that be expensive? Won't that rack up debt? And I sort of almost fell off my chair that we, we'd already shifted to talking about the size of, of deficits and, and debt at that point. 
um, you know, I think it has been held up in the past two decades as a signal of economic competency, um, and it's an easy thing to measure. Um, you know, we can see whether the budget's in surplus or in deficit, and we can see what debt is as a share of GDP. Um, and so I think that by using that as the sort of barometer of economic competence, um, journalists have kind of just learnt to look for that particular measure. Um, and they've not been good at understanding how the, you know, how the kind of economic case for that shifts as, as circumstances shift, as interest rates drop when you're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so I would, I would love to see um, more people sort of going out and just making that case publicly and even sitting down um, with journalists and, um, you know, having academics kind of talk them through um, the way in which um, you think about this differently at different points in the economic cycle. I'm kind of more optimistic. I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think when you looked at the government's response, they started by leaking out stuff about how they might do five billion, but they weren't going to have a terrible splash like mm. Rudd did, and then they were going to have something a bit bigger, but it still was going to be completely different from what Rudd did. And Biden said, actually, we're going to do twice as much as Rudd did, um, and if we have to do four times as much, we will. And of course, this in the year when finally the returns, I mean, for I suppose the fourth time. This was the year the return to surplus had been, had been announced. I think, I mean, I, I suppose I haven't been remarkably impressed by the contributions of economic journalists, I have to say. I mean, they just haven't. Uh, yeah. The ones who were good before have stayed, stayed good, and the ones who weren't haven't really learned anything much in the context of uh, the recession. But I think, I, think the, I think that stuff about debt still had purchase. I think it did labour damage at the last election with Clive Palmer's ads. I think to the extent that people are doing anything serious now, they're saying, well, why don't we go back to World War II and see what happened then? Yeah, we came out of World War II with a huge debt and it seemed to go away. Let's, uh, let's, let's look at that. So I, I think, I mean, there's, there's always, a temp, you know, always a feeling of just slip back to what you know. That's what the government's doing in terms of policy. But I think the idea that anybody's going to be driving a debt truck around the country or, or anything of that kind, I think people will just laugh. Yeah. yeah, I don't think they're going to be driving a debt truck around the country, but what I do think is, um, so I agree on the first phase of the response and, you know, I think it's mm. great that, you know, the, the kind of ideologies out the window lines and we just do what it takes. I think, you know, it's to the government's credit that they did that. Um, but I think that becomes a harder position for them to sustain in that. Well, I worry it becomes a harder yeah. position. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, mean, I think we'll, we'll see with the budget what, uh, yeah, what they come up with. But I mean, I think... I mean, terrible though it is, I mean, the gas policy again just says, look, you know, we used to go on with all this stuff about let the market do this and, and now we, you know, and I, I mean, they haven't replaced it with anything positive, but I think, um, I think you know, when they're faced with the choice of, look, do we do something really hard and unpleasant or do we go to the bond markets and, and issue yeah, $50 billion of 30-year bonds at zero. Um, yeah, the appeal of the, the appeal of saying, well, it appears we can get this money for nothing, so why don't we just go out and get it, is going to be, it's going to be a pretty powerful counterweight. And the fact that they can vaguely remember that they were talking about debt and how terrible it was a few years ago, I think, yeah, we'll, ju we'll just pass. Mm. I, think, oh, I, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. right. <laughs> October the sixth, we will find out. <laughs> yeah, we'll see, we will find out. I mean, I'm sure they'll say something, but but my guess is there won't be there won't be a surplus, and there won't be a there won't be a path to return to surplus within the budget estimates. And if they bring forward the tax cuts, that's even more true because because the growth that was going to fund those has long since disappeared. So. Um, yeah, no, I think that's right. They won't have a return to surplus, but what I'm, I'm concerned yeah. they just will not do enough to stimulate as well. Oh, yeah. I, I think that's I think that's quite. Like, I think they've run out of ideas in that sense, um, but more in the sense of yeah, I don't I don't think it's exact. It's primarily debt anymore that's driving it as much as much as some feeling of what we've done enough and we can't do much more. I mean, yeah. in some sense, the same kind of thing, but without 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 the sort of idea of we have to be in surplus or anything like that. I think that idea is that idea is gone. And then you sort of say, well, how much debt can we have? As someone who's seen the Clyde Palmer ads ramping up in Queensland ahead of October, I do hope you're both right. Um, two quick questions before we start wrapping up. And 
one is quite a sober question. Early reporting is saying that the pandemic will largely be affecting women more than others. How can we rectify this in our recovery efforts? Um, this is a great question. Um, so it is true that um, women were dis disproportionately lost jobs in the, the early phase of the pandemic when things were locked down. Um, the happy news to the extent there is any, that as things started to reopen, at least outside of Victoria, um, women gained jobs at a faster rate. So now if we look at the employment impacts, it's about even between men and women. Uh, but what really concerns me is if you look at uh, all the policies announced so far for the recovery mm. phase, um, they are extremely construction yeah. focused. Um, and, you know, and as I said, you know, I think construction, doing things for the construction sector makes sense. Uh, I think it should be part of the answer. But, you know, you are essentially only targeting <laughs> one part of the economy. And this is a really different recession, as, as John has mm. said, you know, this is led down by the impact of the sectors that were shut down, which were services sectors. Mm. Um, and so it makes sense when you're crafting a response to do things that are gonna support jobs in those services sectors. Um, and you know, that's the way we're gonna really help, help women and help young people. I'd add to that that a lot of the, a lot of the construction is transport infrastructure, which is 100% the wrong choice. First, yeah, construction is two sorts of things. It's big infrastructure projects, which employ hardly anybody, yep. and it's housing. And I mean, they may have a gesture with their crazy home renovation scheme, but obviously, yeah, I mean, if, if they want jobs in construction, they should be targeting housing. And if they want efficient ones, they should be targeting social housing. Uh, Whereas instead, yeah, and the last thing we need, I think, is more transport infrastructure. If we wanted a big infrastructure project that would employ significant numbers of people, fixing the MBN is is yeah, that's something which, which would actually employ far more people than a gas pipeline or a, a major congestion busting project for all the people who are supposedly going to be rushing back to the office sometime. Uh, never. And yeah, yeah. I think. Hopefully soon. <laughs> yeah. None okay, of my just, uh, um, I'll close the office. I've got the office right here and it can stay stay there in my background. So we'll see how that, uh, <laughs> see how that goes. But, uh, Are you promising, John, you won't be using the uh, $25,000 grant to upgrade a granny flat or a bathroom? Sadly, I didn't, I didn't. You know, if they'd given me enough warning, I'm sure I could have, uh, I'm sure I could have run up the... Pre oh, I mean, that, it was... Uh, yeah, at some point around about then, the government kind of lost the plot. Mm. Um, yeah, it was a proposal that was yeah, all it could do was provide a check to some lucky person who decided this, who already decided this would be a great time to uh, put on a second story in a spa bath. Um, I think yeah. the best that can be said for and, it is it probably is going to get basically no take up. Um, so yeah. and, yeah, you know, at least no, it won't so cost much, but it's not going to do much. Yeah. So you know, I think as I say, if it happened, if it happened that you just signed the deal with the builder the week before. And the government said, oh, we'll give you money. Well, you, 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 it's great. Yeah, but yeah, and unfortunately that's been characteristic of, of everything they've done really. Uh, yeah, they, got, they exceeded my expectations massively in March and April and, and are now living down to them pretty catastrophically, unfortunately. Yeah, um, can I just make one um, other point about women that I should have made before? Yeah. Um, the other big issue is childcare. Yeah. Um, so we, we sort of had free childcare for a period, um, then we've gone back to full fees, um, albeit with some additional support for the sector. Um, I am really concerned about post, um, or in the October onwards, when JobKeeper starts to wind back and JobSeeker starts to wind back, that we will see more parents pulling their children from, from care, because um, out-of-pocket costs are very, very high in this country. Um, and that's bad for the children, obviously, because they don't get the continuity of care, but it's also really bad for the employment prospects, particularly of mothers. Um, so we know that women will take on the lion's share of that unpaid work. If it was the case before the pandemic, it was the case during the pandemic, um, and it just makes it much harder for them to get back into the workforce at that point if they don't have childcare available. Um, they can't pick up hours as they become available. So. Um, you know, if the government really wanted to do something to help women, um, a package to boost childcare subsidies would be a really good place to, to put your money.
Excellent. Thank you. Um, I might roll in closing, I might roll a few questions into my final question to both of you. And we've had a few questions in the chat about what should young 20 somethings do? Say, retrain, get a job, any job. Is any job better than studying right now? Uh, what should young people wish for in the upcoming federal budget? What would be an ideal outcome for us younger Australians? And my final question to both of you in closing, uh, what do you think, what would you like personally for all the young Australians who are either working or studying right now, who are concerned about the future, what would you like us to take away from this evening? Number one priority. Um, I'll try and answer a few of those. I, I think, um, I think the, yeah, if, if you have a good opportunity of full-time education, this is, this is a good time to take it. Uh, uh, universities and TAFEs will be very keen to welcome you, I'm sure of that. Um, assuming the government doesn't totally screw up the, the financing package. Um, it's going to be quite a while before things, uh, before things return to normal. I guess I was going to go on and mention, as Danielle was saying, the adverse impact on women has somewhat evened out, but the adverse impact on young people I think hasn't. Mm -hmm. And partly because it reinforces a massive problem of you know, what we used to call school to work transition back in the day, but, but lots of young people were underemployed before the uh, before the pandemic started, and and that's only got worse. So I guess um, if the government could come up uh, with a really creative package to get young people out of that nether world of part-time employment and into into uh, real jobs, uh, real in the sense of being either full-time jobs or permanent part-time jobs, uh, that would be a great thing. Partly, of course, just getting getting rid of casualisation and contracting all the things that have failed us so badly. In the in the recession in the in the pandemic uh, would be a step in the right direction. Um, look, I would say um, policy matters a lot, um, and we should be holding government account for for policy in this space because it is just so pivotal um, for for young people's future. So you know. If you if you open the budget document or you open the you know the website summarising the budget document, um, you know what we need to see is significant spending, um, including on services. Uh, we need to see measures that are going to directly help those really hard hit sectors that are big employers of young people, like hospitality, like retail. Um, like the arts, and there are you know a lot of um, you know creative schemes that are happening around you know vouchers for tourism and subsidies for eating out, you know middle of the week, and there's lots of things that government can do um, if it just contains stage three tax cuts and big ticket infrastructure, then that's a fail. Um, and I would love to see young people really engaging in these questions. I think you know the the energy that young people have shown and the leadership they've shown around climate change is really phenomenal. Um, but, you know, these issues matter a lot as well. Um, so, you know, bringing some of that pressure to bear um, because you guys are really organised, I think, I'm much more organised than my generation, um, you know, on these types of issues, I think would be incredibly important. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Uh, I lied. I'd like to get you on record. Final question of the night. Trump, Biden. I like predictions. Uh, and we've been recorded, so your wisdom will be a. I'm a probability theorist. I I I think five thirty eight is a bit too pessimistic. I would say, I would say about ninety percent chance of Biden. And we well, ninety percent chance of Biden getting the winning the majority of states. Uh, Whether well, he gets to act as president, I'm less sure. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I mean, it, it does. It does look like Biden, and you know. yeah. Hard to remember the stakes being this high. Yeah, at least a ten percent chance of a military coup or something of that kind. I would say. Well, we'll cut it there because that's a uh, negative thinking. We're not going to have that in this chat. <laughs> thank you. Though. No, thank you very much, both of you, for a really informing chat. I learned a lot about economics and also what I should and shouldn't be hopeful for for the future. So I hope that everyone else watching has been uh, similarly informed. And seriously, thank you everyone who joined to watch. We get that Zoom is. A bit tiring right now and we really appreciate you taking an extra hour and a half on top of your already working from home zoom load to listen to us and support these questions we think they're quite important and we're really really happy with the turnout uh tonight and just on that i'd like to thank a few quick groups who helped us get the word out about tonight's event 
including Young Economist Queensland, University of Queensland, including the School of Economics and the RTP Student Coalition, QUT School of Economics and Finance, the Global Shapers Gold Coast, Griffith University's Commerce Society and the Department of Accounting, Finance and Economics, Monash Business School, Grattan Institute, and obviously John and Danielle here. So thank you both again for your contributions tonight. We really enjoyed it and we really appreciate you taking the time. And just before we go, I'd like to say that Grattan Institute is going to be launching a internship uh, quite soon. So keep an eye out on their website, social media for that. Clearly be an awesome opportunity for anyone who's watching and interested. Um, and from tonight, we'll be uh, sorry, finishing our six event series with parts five and six. In October, we're looking at climate change and sovereignty for Pacific Island nations. And then the end of the year event, we're looking at social justice, human rights, and the SDGs through art, which will be our first ever art exhibition. So it should be quite exciting. And further detail on all of that, including upcoming events and opportunities with us. And we'll be sharing more information as well from Grattan, Danielle, and John in the coming days. And all of that is accessible on our social medias, which you can go to through the Humanitex event portal. So thank you once again for joining. Uh, thanks, John and Danielle, for an awesome talk. And thank you all for your questions and your time. We'd love for you to become a member of the UNYP and can you engage in the work that we're doing. But finally, thank you all again and have a lovely night. Thanks for having us, Joel. Thanks, thanks everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you both. <laughs>